praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Let's, let's thank him right now for that price that he's paid. Hallelujah. That we can rejoice in our salvation. That we can have assurance and assurity this morning. That we are healed. That we are delivered. That we are prospered. Hallelujah. That we are all that he has commanded us to be in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody give him a big hand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless the worship team. Thank you, Mike. Praise the Lord. A little, little bit of a glitch there trying to get the computer up, but we're up and going and all is good. Hallelujah. So God bless all of you for being here this morning. Why don't you just take a moment if you didn't get a chance to before and just shake somebody's hand and tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Praise God. You'll be back. Okay. We'll have uh, we'll have prayer here in a bit. Thanks, Sam. All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. <laughs> praise God. Appreciate y'all being here this morning. God's good, amen. amen. You know, I heard a story about a guy who was, uh, anybody, you know, the enemy tried to get you down? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. He tries, but uh, amen. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. He that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. But this fellow was really feeling bummed out and just, just said, I, I just feel like a dog, you know, and his wife finally convinced him to go see a therapist, a psychiatrist, and he went to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, well, how, how can I help you? And he said, well, doc, I just, I just feel like a dog. And the doctor said, well, how long have you felt this way? And he said, well, since I was a puppy. <laughs> and he said, well, then get up here on the couch. And he said, I, I, I'm not allowed on the furniture. <laughs> so he gave him two uh, dog bones and sent him home, told him to call him in the morning, praise the Lord. But... Amen. That's what the devil tries to do, get us to feel like we're just nothing and that we're nobodies and that we're failures. And, but I'm telling you, we, we are victorious, always victorious in Jesus. Amen. He's got a great plan for your life. Amen. We just need to tap into it. We just need to get on the same page with him. Amen. And we'll begin to see all that he has for us. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, if uh, I could get Roberto, if you and Dan would come and take up the offering this morning. Dan's out of the boot. Praise the Lord. And uh, he's doing much better. Happy to see that. Praise God. Amen. God is good. Roberto, if you would just pray for the offering. Father, thank you for all the honor, praise, and honor in this offering. We thank you for the word that we're about to receive and know that it's been given to you, packed and filled with the great people. We thank you for all your blessings and your grace and your permission and everything that you do for us, and we will continue to do it for the rest of our lives. We thank you, Lord, now for the opportunity to be able to give this offering, to receive or to show as consecrated in his hands, as well as you as we thank the Father and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the Lord bless you as you sow into his kingdom. God bless you all. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Thank the Lord. Amen. And you know, I've been thinking that, uh, in fact, I haven't just been thinking it, I've been experiencing it. God is wanting to do something spectacular in all of our lives, and then collectively he wants to do that within the church. Yeah. And how many of you know the moment you step out in faith, yeah. there's some ugly little demon shows up with a bunch of junk that says the opposite of what you're confessing, amen, or the opposite of what you're believing God to do. That's what the devil does. He comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And the first thing he does is come for the word that God has given you whether it's about your healing, about your deliverance, about your finances, or about all these things uh, together. The enemy's always moving and uh, operating, amen, in the flesh. So, praise the Lord. I want to talk to you about a couple of things here this morning. We've all had uh, been talking about uh, a sense of what God wants to do in this new year. Now, I know 2017 is the year of Jubilee, but I want you to realize as well, and I'm not against you know, using that as a, as a type and a shadow, but that is what it is. Jesus, Jubilee is pointing to Jesus. Yes. He is our Jubilee. Amen. He has set us free. He has prospered us and blessed us and all these things. So there's things God wants to do in this new year, and it's not just because it's Jubilee. It's because we are identifying with Jesus Christ himself. Amen. He sets captives free. Praise the Lord. He's the one that prospers. He's the one that delivers. He's the one that saves. So as much as I appreciate the typology, we need to realize that that's what it is. Yes. Everything in that Old Testament, everything in the law is pointing us to some greater truth, which is in Christ. Amen. And that's where our focus has to be, because otherwise we're going to be waiting another 50 years. Hallelujah. Some of us may not have the opportunity to be here for the next Jubilee. Praise God. We may already be, amen, on streets of glory. Hallelujah. Enjoying the presence of the Lord. Yes. I'll still be here, but some of y'all might not be. Praise God. <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying. I want everything God has for me, and I want it now. Praise the Lord. And that's, that's, what, and that's not being greedy or being selfish. That's just being a good Christian. That's just being obedient to what God has done. Amen? So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And, and I want to kind of give your, uh, hopefully get your attention to realize what it is the enemy's doing to hinder what God wants to do. Now, again, he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world, but only if we're in him. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the, the, the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, we are spirit beings, but the issue here is whether or not we're walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. And that doesn't mean you're saved or unsaved. It just means if you're in the flesh, you're going to flesh stuff. I mean, you're going to respond to situations and circumstances in the flesh, and that's going to keep you. Here's the deal. God is not going to condemn you. He's already justified you. He's already declared you righteous and holy and pure and perfect in Christ. Amen. But when you're in the flesh, what happens? God isn't condemning you. Your own heart condemns you. Yeah. Yeah. I did this. I shouldn't have done that. You know how it goes. And then you're sitting around feeling really miserable and bad. I, shouldn't have, I wish I hadn't done this. I wish I hadn't done that. That's not God. No. That's your own heart. Because the scripture says, if, even it, when your heart condemns you, God does not. Right. God is greater than your own heart, than your own thinking. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But when we get into the flesh and act and, and respond to the flesh, then our own guilty conscience wants to attack us, and the enemy just pours it on. You know, wow, you ought, to feel, you ought to feel bad. You know, I mean, after all, you are a real jerk. You know, you shouldn't have done that. That's not God. That's the thing you have to realize, first of all, 
God sees you perfect, righteous, holy, and pure. Amen. You're not making any mistakes in Jesus. You, you've already, that, all those mistakes have already been dealt with. Hallelujah. They've already been taken care of. Praise God. Amen. All right. So I want to read a couple of scriptures to you this morning to start off with. And I'd like to begin with Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1 and verse 11. And I've got to get rid of this cough drop before I choke on it. Okay, Ephesians 1 and 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And just to begin with, just focus on this first sentence here. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. In whom? In Christ. In Christ we have an inheritance. And we are in Christ because we are believers. We've been in Christ from the moment that we accepted him as our Lord and Savior. All right? So, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, we'll come back to this in a little bit, but next I'd like to go to 1 John, Sheila. 1 John chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. 1 John 3... Verses 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. You know, years ago, Charlie Chaplin, you know, the silent, y'all are old enough, you've seen Charlie Chaplin, you know, the little tramp. Well, years ago, they had a, uh, a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest, and Charlie Chaplin secretly entered the contest. And he didn't win. That's a, it's true. I'm serious. Charlie Cha the Charlie Chaplin enters the Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and loses. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The judges determined that somebody looked and acted more like Charlie Chaplin than Charlie Chaplin. Imagine how he must have been feeling. Praise the Lord. It's crazy, huh? It's possible that a story like that could be told about Jesus. Because too often, Jesus becomes a reflection of ourselves. So we read scriptures, and we read Jesus' teachings, and we say, Amen, praise the Lord, because we assume he's talking to somebody else. Praise the Lord. Well, he won't mind if I don't show love to somebody who offends me. After all, me and Jesus, you know, we're tight. Back to uh, 1 John 3 and verse 2, please. I'm saying this because the enemy wants to divide. A house divided can't stand. A double-minded man, that's, just the, that's your house, praise the Lord. You are the temple of the living God. If he can get you having different thinking, you know, fleshly thoughts and, and, and spiritual thoughts, then he'll have you confused. And you can get nothing from God if you're double-minded. Amen. So a house divided can't stand, whether it's me personally or us collectively as a church, and the enemy knows that, so his job is to divide us. Because God's wanting to do something, and the enemy wants to stop it. So, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <laughs> Hallelujah. Unless you don't know how he is, then you're going to look like what you think he is. Exactly. Praise God. Exactly.
At the end of uh, World War II, right after the, uh, the peace was signed in Europe, there was a lot of hunger, there was a lot of deprivation, there were a lot of orphans, widows, I mean it was chaos. And an American soldier was stationed in London, and he was on his way back to the base one cold morning, and he turned the corner in his Jeep, and he spotted this little boy with his nose pressed against the window of a pastry shop. Inside, the, the baker was making dough for a fresh batch of donuts, and the hungry little boy stared in silence, watching every move that that baker was making. The soldier got out of the jeep and walked over to where the little boy was, and as the baker took trays of hot pastries out of the oven, the little boy groaned, and the soldier's heart went out to the orphan. He said, son, would you like some of those? And the little boy replied, would I ever? So the soldier went in, and he bought a dozen, put them in a bag, carried them out, simply held out the bag and smiled and said, here you go. And as the soldier turned to walk away, he felt a tug on his coat. And he looked back, and he heard the little boy ask quietly, Mr., are you Jesus? I'd like all of us to ask ourselves, do you suppose we could be mistaken for Jesus. Because as he is, so are we. This isn't about church. This is about a relationship with Jesus. And you don't get to pick who you want to be compassionate to and who you want to love and who you don't want to love and who you're going to respond to in love and who you won't respond to in love. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying this to criticize anybody. I'm saying I know what the enemy's doing. He's doing it to me. He's doing it to you. He's doing it to all of us because he knows we are to be a reflection of Christ. And when that happens, there's something that God is going to pour out. In fact, he's already poured it out. We're just not, we're just not receiving it because we're not identifying with Jesus. We're identifying with our personal issues, with our problems, with our circumstances, with our relationships, hallelujah, when the only relationship we really need to focus on, and I'm just saying this because if we're get focused on our relationship with Jesus, the other relationships will take care of themselves. Amen? We're trying to fix everything and everybody so that they'll be like us. Hallelujah. But unless we're like Jesus, we don't really want them to be like us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I do not want a church of Nathans. Paul said it like this. Follow me as I follow Christ. And if I'm not following Christ, then get out of line in a hurry. Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. See, sometimes it's really easy to love a stranger. Praise God. It's difficult to love somebody that you know, that you interact with. And I'm not just talking about spouses here. I'm talking about we're a family. We are brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. Your first obligation, according to the word of God, to keep all the commandments is to love one another. Amen. Now, if I can't love you, then I'm a hypocrite when I go out here and try to win some wino off the street. Am I wrong? Praise the Lord. Because I'm just picking. It's easier to love this person because I'm only going to see him once every six months. Amen. Or once a month. Amen. Amen. But you I'm going to see a couple times a week probably. Or at least once a week. And if you're not more important to me than some stranger, then they're really not that important to me either. It's more about me doing something so I can say, I did this. Oh, yeah. Well, I wasn't expecting a lot of amen right there, but praise God. <laughs> amen. <laughs> You know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being hateful here. I'm saying we need a, a wake-up call because Jesus is trying to do something in us and for us, and unless we identify with him and unless we get on board with that identity, hallelujah, we're just playing church. 
We're just going through the motions. And God's got something much bigger, amen, than a religious ceremony for all of us. Hallelujah. And he wants to show himself mighty on our behalf. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. He wants to do the miracles that we've been praying for and begging for and asking for and hoping for. It's time that we started declaring them, hallelujah, because it is our inheritance in whom we have an inheritance. Praise God. Praise God. So charity suffereth long. That word charity is actually uh, the best definition or the best translation is actually love. And so he says, love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Love doesn't worry about being right. Scripture says sometimes it's better to take the wrong than try to justify yourself. How many married people we got in here? Hallelujah. Well, if you haven't learned it, you're going to because it'll keep coming back. Hallelujah. It'll keep coming around. Praise the Lord. I know I'm right about this. You may know you're right, but that isn't going to change anything. Praise the Lord. This is my lovely wife sitting right here. Praise the Lord. And I can tell you, if I think I've won an argument, it just isn't over yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's, there's just a lull. Amen. There's just, a, there's just a, a silence here for a little bit. I haven't won anything. And I, I, I try to remind myself of this. Sometimes I forget, and that's not pretty. Praise the Lord. It's not fun. It's not because she's, she's a bad woman. It's because she's a good woman. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I'm saying that because I don't want, I'm not going there again. Praise God. All right. But love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love bondeth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked. Hmm. Praise the Lord. All the married guys said, praise the Lord. Not easily provoked. And then the wife said, amen, amen, praise God, amen, praise the Lord. And so it does not behave itself unseemly. It's not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when the Lord says love one another, that's what he's saying. He isn't saying give him a pat on the back and a hug on Sunday morning. He's saying you got to love. You got to take some stuff sometimes. You got to learn to not have to respond because you're right. Sometimes it's better to be wrong and have peace and be like Christ. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 13. And now abides faith. Hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. You know, we, we want faith. We want to be compassionate and, and charitable. But Jesus said, love is the key. In fact, if you back up in these, you don't have to go there, but you can read it on your own. Paul says, if I speak with the tongue of men or angels, if I, if I prophesy, if I have the gifts of this and I lay hands of sick and then this happens and that happens, but I don't have love, I'm just noise. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's something that God sees as greater than these gifts even. And that's love. And we need to take it seriously. Because the enemy has no love whatsoever. So he hates love. He hates to see love operating because love is God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he doesn't like God. Amen. Because God wouldn't play his game. So he doesn't like you because you were born of love. Praise God. John, uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. First John chapter 4 and verse 8. He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. When we see him, we will know him. We will know him because we'll be like him. I suggest we start loving. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is pretty simple. I mean, you don't need a degree in theology, thank the Lord, to understand that he that loveth not knoweth not God because 
God is love. If you want to know what love looks like, you don't have to look any further than the cross. The life and the death of Jesus. He offered total love, total forgiveness to everybody with no strings attached. Look at Jesus as the example. And you quickly realize love is messy. Love isn't always pretty. Love sometimes can be really ugly. Love's messy because people are messed up. And it's messy because you don't get to just do it in church with people that agree with you and the people you choose to love. Love is costly. Love is risky. And love is messy. It'll mess with your ego. And everybody married said yes, praise the Lord. Amen. Most likely you won't be called to die physically in the name of love. But to live in the name of love is still going to cost you some of yourself. And again, I don't want to keep using the marriage analogy, but it's so appropriate because this isn't a, this isn't a 50-50 deal. I tell people this every time I do a wedding. If you think marriage is a 50-50 agreement, you don't know marriage yet. Marriage feels like most of the time, 150 I'm given, whichever one I am. That's just the way love is. And to then be disappointed is to be naive, because if you think it was going to be something else, you should still be dating. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen, because then you can go home and be the jerk that you really are. <laughs> I'm saying amen to that because the Lord knows me. Hallelujah. I can be perfect for anybody for a little while. It's those, it's those long-term things that give me problems. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> but Jesus was perfect at it. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Acts 9, verses 1 through 9. And that's the story of Paul, or Saul at the time, who's on his way to Damascus to get uh, legal uh, papers that would give him the right to even persecute more and more and do more damage to the church than he was already had done. And so Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of them letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any of this way, if he found any of these believers, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks or fight against the, uh, the, the, the yoke that you're in. Amen. And he, and he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the city, and it will be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. So why do you persecute me? Why, why are you persecuting my people? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, the Lord spoke to me recently. Sally and I had had a disagreement. And, hey, we have them. Praise the Lord. I'm a man. She's a woman. We've been married 37 years, and we still don't see eye to eye on everything. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the Lord said to me, why are you persecuting my church? And I thought, wait a minute, I'm... Oh, I see. That happens with 
us in the way we interact with one another, not just our spouses. But when we act ugly to another brother or a sister, we're persecuting Jesus. He said, hey, why are you persecuting the church? You're persecuting me. Now, we, again, we like to, amen, praise the Lord, because we're sure he's talking to somebody else. Because he wouldn't talk to me like that. Huh? I'm his beloved. Yes, you are. But you forget, so are they. Praise the Lord. So what had gone wrong? How had a man that was so intent on doing the will of God, and he was. He believed in God. He, he was committed to God. He had spent his life studying the word of God. He was a Pharisee. We, we, to us, that's kind of a negative term, but at that time, they were the elite of that particular religion, of that faith, you might even say. So how could this guy, so focused and so intent on doing the will of God, end up so far outside the will of God? Saul had all the information. He had the Torah. He had all the information about God. He knew a lot about faith, but he didn't know the source of faith. And the metaphor they use here is blindness. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything or nor or anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Praise the Lord. Faith works by love. 1 John, again, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Let's go back to where we started again. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So I'm just saying information about Jesus matters. The identification of Jesus matters, but not in the absence of relationship with Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. It matters that we know stuff about Jesus. Amen. It matters that we identify Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, but not without the relationship because we become a Saul so intent on doing the will of God that we're out persecuting our own brothers and sisters. And in fact, we're persecuting the Lord. Praise God. It'll, it'll, listen, I'm telling you, grace is a beautiful thing. It's, it's, the, it's one of the great messages. In fact, it is the great message of the Bible. But it doesn't give us a right to not love. It doesn't give us the right To not love Jesus in our relationships with one another. That's how we do it. Praise the Lord. Grace. You see, what happens a lot of times in grace is when you start learning more and more about grace, the tendency is then to go the extreme. Well, I'm going to be forgiven. In fact, I am forgiven, so it's no big deal. Because if I screw up here, if I do this thing or I do that thing, I'm going to be forgiven. And it's true. But the point of grace is to make you mature, is to cause you to grow up so that you will then be graceful. That you will extend the same grace that you are reveling in and enjoying. You'll be willing to extend that grace to other people. So it's not just for you. Praise the Lord. I thank God for me and for the grace that God has given me. But for me to just hoard that grace and take advantage of it for myself and then not, not be willing to, to, to show grace to other people, it's, it's beyond hypocritical. It's just plain stupid. It's not understanding the Lord. It's not seeing God as he really is. It's seeing him like me. 
Praise the Lord. So I'm saying all this to get to where I want to go. Because this is where God wants us to be, but because of the other, we're not, I believe that's one reason why we're not experiencing our inheritance. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, let's, let, me, let me go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. And see, the beauty of this is if you're offended, get over it. Praise the Lord, because you're not supposed to be easily offended, hallelujah, and I'm not trying to offend you, and if I am, I have grace to cover that. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with your head right now, but praise the Lord. You know what I'm talking about, because down deep inside, you're thinking about that one, but you know, I, I don't really want to have to go there with them, praise the Lord, but okay, God, God is good. I don't think God ever feels that way about me, but he certainly has every right to feel that way about me multiple times a week. Like, I'm just sick of saying nice things about him because he's not being that nice right now. Hallelujah. But he doesn't think that way. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am perfect in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. I said to begin with, in whom? We have the inheritance because we are in Christ. Because we have this relationship, because we are one with him, right? Obtained and inherited. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So, now there's all kinds of arguments, and you all have been in church any time you know this, about the issue of predestination. And we know Calvinism and all these things that talk about predestination, and it's, most of it's just misunderstandings. But in this context, it's not talking about heaven or hell. It's talking about inheritance. Amen? So simply put, as a child of God, having been born from above, born of God, a child of God, I am in his will. And you are as well. When a person writes out their will, all of their assets are declared among their children. And at that moment, those children become predestinated or included in the will. Right? They didn't do anything. They were just kids. They were just the kids of the person writing the will. So at that moment, the moment that will is declared, they become predestinated in the will. For their inheritance. Now Ephesians says, according to the purpose of him, right? We've, we've obtained this pre, being predestinated according to the purpose of him. And all that really means is, this is what God wants. According to the purpose of God, it just simply means, this is, the, this is God's will or this is what God wants. Amen? So God's purpose is for his children, that's you and I, to have his goods, his properties, his prosperity. So Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now that tells you exactly what our inheritance consists of, and how we're going to see it manifest in our lives. Praise the Lord. Two little words. All things. Praise the Lord. Somebody ought to get excited right now. All things. Praise God. That's significant. All things, all things are our inheritance. Hallelujah. Whoa, praise God. All things. Say, well, whoa, wait a minute. That's, that's way too big. We're talking about God's inheritance, God's will to us. Did not God create all things? Is not everything God's? It is not does the heavens and the earth, they belong to God. He has given us all things. That may be too big for our finite mind, but it's not too big for my spirit to grasp and get all excited about what God can do. Praise the Lord. And how mad and how angry and how frustrated do you suppose that makes the devil 
who wants to be in charge of all things, but he can't be because they all belong to me. That's why he wants to destroy me. That's why he wants to keep me out of the will of God. That's why he wants to keep me from identifying with Jesus Christ. That's why he wants to keep me, amen, from loving one another because where there's strife, God cannot move the way he wants to move because why? I'll have a guilty conscience. The conscience, the guilt did not come from God. The condemnation did not come from God. It come from my flesh that did the stupid thing. Praise God. So the enemy tries to get you into a failure of some kind or a lack of love, and then he condemns you for it. Amen. And you cooperate by self-condemnation. But God's love is greater. His heart is greater than condemnation, even our own, if we know. Because this is his, this is his desire. This is what God wants. His purpose is for you to have all things. That's what he wants for you. It's not something we're trying to twist his arm or, or finagle or finesse somehow that we're going to get this by doing this thing and that thing and the other. No, this is his desire for us to have all things. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also, that we may be also glorified together. All right? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. Hebrews 1 and verse 2. We ought to, get, we ought to be so pumped and so excited. And I'm not just trying to work on emotions here. I'm just saying, if we really know God's purpose for us, God's desire for us, that this is what God wants us to have, all we got to do is wake up. All we got to do is start acting like the children of God. Amen? Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Did he just say we were heirs and joint heirs with Jesus? What, what was the inheritance of Jesus? All things. So if you're trying to, you know, mathematically figure this all out, just stop. It's all things. All. When you get all, you, and there's, it excludes everything else. Because there is nothing else if it's all. Praise the Lord. Joint heirs means equal heirs. In order for Christ and us, think about it now. In order for Jesus and me and you to have equal or joint claim to the kingdom birthright, which is the inheritance, we both had to be born at the same time. Praise the Lord. You remember the story of Esau and Jacob? Esau's the older brother. Jacob's reaching for the heel because, amen, he's wanting Esau's heel because the firstborn was the one that was entitled to the birthright, to the inheritance. So in order for Christ and us to have equal or joint claim to the kingdom birthright, we both had to be born at the same time, not one grabbing for the heel of the other. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ by grace, you're saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Paul uses the words quickened here in verse 5. Made alive. Amen. Amen. Christ had to be made alive before he could be raised. Right? Okay. Legally, we were born again with Christ when he was born out of hell because we were in him. We were in him before the foundation of the world, if you want to go back to the beginning. 
But we were in him. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me that lives, but Christ lives in me. So I, was, I died with him. You died with him. Hallelujah. He was born out of hell because we were in him when he was born again. He was the firstborn of many brethren. Amen. But we were all born at the same time. He was the first of the type. Amen. That's why in Ephesians 1.11 it says, In whom or in him we have obtained an inheritance. Because we are in him. Praise the Lord. Because when he was born again and made an heir of God, so were we. I'm te- well, I think somebody ought to shout hallelujah because that is what he's trying to get us to understand. You didn't just escape hell. You already been to hell and Jesus has got out and, and were resurrected with him and now you have an inheritance, amen, of all things that God has ordained for you to experience and to enjoy. Praise God. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. I, I'm determined, I'm going to have my stuff. Now, I know that sounds funky and, you know, kind of charismatic or whatever. But that's because that's what God has put in my heart. Amen. And he has it in you, too. And we're, we're kind of timid and thinking, oh, you know, I just, you know, I, I, I feel kind of awkward about. Why? It's yours. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And it's God's purpose or God's want to for you to have it. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Hallelujah. How shall he not? That, uh, that, that That by itself ought to excite you. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So we ask, we say, how, how's God going to do this? I got this problem. I got this issue. I got this thing. I got this sickness. I got this other. How, how's God going to do it? We're supposed to be asking, how can he not? Who has given me all things? What? Is anything impossible for God? Is anything too hard for God? How shall he not? Whatever it is. Just whatever your thing is right now, how shall he not give me all things? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All things are ours. And they're ours now. All things are ours now. Everybody say now. 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 Praise the Lord. Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Okay? Now look at, look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. So the promise wasn't to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we always hear that, well, the seed wasn't a bunch of people. The seed was Jesus. Well, let me remind you, you're in Jesus, and that's what he's talking about. Amen? Heirs according to the promise. In Christ. What promise? Romans 4.13 again. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Inheriting the whole world. That's the promise. So some people argue, well, yeah, but that's when Jesus returns. That's the second coming of Christ. Well, look at verse 16. 
Romans 4 and verse 16. Heir of the world, right? It's not when Jesus comes back the second time. It's not somewhere off in the distant ethereal future. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, therefore, he says, therefore, it's a pronoun that's referring back to verse 13. Promise of inheriting the world might be by grace. Praise the Lord. Amen. Romans 4, 16, therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to also that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. It says to the end. That's important. Because yeah. it demonstrates that the children of God should begin inheriting from the time we are born again yeah. to the end of the world. He's not talking about it's going to happen at the end of the world. He says the moment you're born again, you're an heir. And so you should inherit, amen, all the way to the end of the world or the end of the age, however you want to define that. He didn't say we were going to inherit at the end or after the end. Look at Romans, or excuse me, Matthew 28, verse 20. Matthew 28, 20. This is a good example of that same kind of language. Matthew 28, 20, he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Woo. So does that mean he'll meet us at the end of the world or after the end? No, it means that he is with us at the moment of our new birth and will be with us all the way to the end. Hallelujah. Praise God. And if he is, we are heirs and joint heirs of all things the moment you got born again all the way to the end. Praise God. Hallelujah. Romans 8, verse 32. Romans 8 and 32. See, we ought to be, man, we, we ought to be walking in faith. We ought to be believing for things way beyond this, the, the, the little things we're thinking. We were hoping and pleading and begging and worrying and fretting and fussing. Hey, all things, man, what, what's the little thing about the car payment? I mean, what's the big deal about, about this, you know, sales program? Or what, what's the, what, you know, what are we all freaked out about this little thing or that little thing? All things are mine for crying out loud. What do you need? And I should be worrying about what I got. I, I'd be thinking about what can I give? Yeah. What, what can I give you? Because I got, I got all things, man. I got more than I need. I got everything I need, and I got all things are available to me. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Yeah. How shall he not? Yeah. Not how's he going to? Yeah. How shall he not? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. I'm just going to give you a few scriptures here real quick just to validate this and get it sunk into our heads and to our hearts. Amen. Let no man, therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Yeah. All things are yours. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Rich don't bother me. Trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. Rich got nothing on us. We got all things. They got some things. They got more things than some, but we got all things. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You are an heir, a joint heir with Christ. You are a king, little K. Hallelujah. He's the king of kings. Hallelujah. And we have all things. We've received our inheritance, the kingdom. It's ours. Second Peter 1, verse 3. We've got to get bold. Start acting like who we are. Start living like who we are. Start experiencing who we are. Because there's a world out there that needs to see Jesus. They need to experience him. 
They need some stuff. And we got it all. Praise the Lord. According as his divine nature hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So back to where we started, right? According as his divine power hath given, given, that's a past tense, we have it, all things that pertain unto life and godliness through what? Knowing him. Through our knowledge of him. So I don't want to be, you know, some judge at a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest, and Charlie walks in, and I say, but that guy looks a lot more like Charlie than he does. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I want to know Jesus, because knowing him guarantees that I have all things that pertain to life and godliness, and nothing shall be withheld. Praise the Lord. Listen, we've been robbed, guys and gals. We've been robbed. We've been robbed of life's enjoyments by misunderstanding or misinterpreting the Word of God. And how many know He is the Word? And when we miss it in the Word, we're missing Him. Remember, Jesus is the Word. If Jesus were in a Jesus look-alike contest, could we pick him out? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. When he appears to you, you recognize him. Not because he looks like you, but because you look like him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see him as he is. And Jesus wants to reveal himself to us so that we can inherit all things. It's time to make up for the time that we've lost. It's time to make up for our inheritance being unmanifested. We don't have to wait. We can start enjoying our inheritance now. This is the year of Jubilee, right? What does it say? Release from bondage. You got to give them everything back. We got something way better than Jubilee. We have Jesus that the Jubilee was a type of. And instead of just getting free from one thing or this thing or that thing and getting a little of this back or a little of that back, he wants to give us all things. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's the year of Jubilee is nothing. Compared to Christ, compared to our inheritance in him, it's, it's little, it's nothing, it's minimal. This is all things we're talking about. We need to be who we are in Christ and receive what is ours in Jesus, who is our jubilee. Receive all things. When it all comes down to it, he is all things. Because if you have him, you got it all. Nothing is lacking. He's my healer. He's my deliverance. He's my prosperity. He's my deliverer. He is all things. And I got him. I've got an inheritance. I was born the same time he was born. Hallelujah. And I'm going to live with him forever. Praise God. Stand to your feet for a moment. Praise God. Let's thank him for all things. Praise God. Let's declare this day. I'm not going to walk in poverty anymore. I'm not walking in sickness and disease. I'm not walking in lack. I'm not walking in fear. I'm not walking in, in unbelief. I'm going to love the way Jesus loves, and I'm going to have my all things that he has provided for me in Jesus' name. Praise God. I'm going to have more than enough. I'm going to have all things. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Now, the devil's going to come and try to give you all kinds of reasons not to believe this. Just tell him you are a liar. I got all things, hallelujah, and you got nothing. Praise God. You got nothing but a lie. Your stuff has already been determined. It's over for you. Amen. And it's just beginning for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, normally at this time, I would, I would take up prayer requests. That seems redundant at this point. Praise the Lord. So I just want to say this. Whatever it is you're wanting, whatever it is you're needing, whatever your problem, how about just claim it right now in Jesus' name and tell the devil he's a liar? Move on, because all stuff is mine. All this belongs to me. I am healed in Jesus' name. I am delivered in Jesus' name. I have all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. I am not limited in any way. Praise God. God wants to show himself mighty on my behalf. He wants to show himself rich whole, healthy, on my behalf and through me, hallelujah. I'm going to love like Jesus loves, hallelujah, because it pays great dividends, hallelujah. It, it's all things are mine. Praise God. Hallelujah. And every time the devil comes to you from now on in the future, you remind him of his future. He has none. We got all things all the way to the end, and then we get heaven, hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord as the, as the worship team comes. Let's just thank Him, hallelujah, and praise Him for what He's done. Hallelujah. 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 I give you this to what's going on while we're getting up here. I talked to the pastor the other night. We were, we were talking about some stuff here, uh, some equipment here at the church, and and uh, immediately, um, in the situation we were facing, uh, my mom was hauled off into the ambulance to the hospital. Um, and I talked to Pastor about that. And before Pastor got done praying, we prayed together against come up against this situation. Uh, they thought she had a stroke, uh, some other things going on. But before Pastor got done praying, I looked over on my laptop. My mom was jacking around on Facebook, okay? <laughs> They did MRIs and everything else like that. They said something had happened, da, 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 da. but there are no symptoms. Praise God. She's home. Thank God is good. So he's uh, right now, guys, and we're going to declare it right now in Jesus' name. What a great God.
of you. 